Peter Kropotkin, Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution Introduction Two aspects of animal life impressed me most during the journeys which I made in my youth in eastern Siberia and northern Manchuria. One of them was the extreme severity of the struggle for existence, which most species of animals have to carry on against an inclement nature. The enormous destruction of life which periodically results from natural agencies and the consequent paucity of life over the vast territory which fell under my observation. And the other was that even in those spots where animal life teemed in abundance, I failed to find, although I was eagerly looking for it, that bitter struggle for the means of existence among animals belonging to the same species, which was considered by most Darwinists, though not always by Darwin himself, as the dominant characteristic of the struggle for life and the main factor of evolution. The terrible snowstorms which sweep over the northern portion of Eurasia in the latter part of the winter and the glazed frost that often follows them, the frost and the snowstorms which return every year in the second half of May when the trees are already in full blossom and insect life swarms everywhere. The early frosts and occasionally the heavy snowfalls in July and August which suddenly destroy myriads of insects, as well as the second broods of the birds in the prairies, the torrential rains due to the monsoons, which fall in more temperate regions in August and September, resulting in inundations on a scale which is only known in America and in Eastern Asia, and swamping on the plateaus areas as wide as European states. And finally, the heavy snowfalls, early in October, which eventually render a territory as large as France and Germany absolutely impracticable, impracticable for rumians, and destroy them by the thousand. These were the conditions under which I saw animal life struggling in northern Asia. They made me realize at an early date the overwhelming importance in nature of what Darwin described as the natural checks to over-multiplication. In comparison to the struggle between individuals of the same species for the means of subsistence, which may go on here and there to some limited extent, but never attains the importance of the former. Paucity of life, underpopulation, not overpopulation, being the distinctive feature of that immense part of the globe which we name Northern Asia. I conceive since then serious doubts, which subsequent study has only confirmed, as to the reality of that fearful competition for food and life within each species, which was an article of faith with most Darwinists, and consequently as to the dominant part which this sort of competition was supposed to play in the evolution of new species. On the other hand, wherever I saw animal life in abundance, as for instance on the lakes where scores of species and millions of individuals came together to rear their progeny, in the colonies of rodents, in the migration of birds which took place at this at that time on a truly American scale along the Ursuri, and especially in a migration of fallow deer, which I witness on the Amur, and during which scores of thousands of these intelligent animals came together from an immense territory, flying before the coming deep snow, in order to cross the Amur where it is narrowest, in all these scenes of animal life which passed before my eyes, I saw mutual aid and mutual support carried on to an extent which made me suspect in it a feature of the greatest importance for the maintenance of life, the preservation of each species, and its further evolution. And finally, I saw among the semi-wild cattle and horses in Transbaikalia, among the rumians everywhere, the squirrels and so on, that when animals have to struggle against scarcity of food in consequence of one of the above mentioned causes, the whole of that portion of the species which is affected by the calamity comes out of the ordeal so much impoverished in vigor and health that no progressive evolution of the species can be based upon such periods of keen competition. Consequently, when my attention was drawn later on to the relations between Darwinism and sociology, I could agree with none of the works and pamphlets that had been written upon this important subject. 
they all endeavored to prove that man, owing to his higher intelligence and knowledge, may mitigate the harshness of the struggle for life between men, but they all recognized at the same time that the struggle for the means of existence of every animal against all its congeners and of every man against all other men was a law of nature. This view, however, I could not accept because I was persuaded that to admit a pitiless inner war for life within each species and to see in that war a condition of progress was to admit something which not only had not yet been proved but also lacked confirmation from direct observation. On the contrary, a lecture on the law of mutual aid, which was delivered at a Russian Congress of Naturalists in January 1880 by the well-known zoologist Professor Kessler, the then dean of the St. Petersburg University, struck me as throwing a new light on the whole subject. Kessler's idea was that besides the law of mutual struggle, there is the law of mutual aid, which for the success of the struggle for life, and especially for the progressive evolution of the species, is far more important than the law of mutual contest. This suggestion, which was in reality nothing but a further development of the ideas expressed by Darwin himself in The Descent of Man, seemed to me so correct and of so great an importance that since I became acquainted with it, with it in 1883, I began to collect materials for further developing the idea which Kessler had only cursorily sketched in his lecture, but had not lived to develop. He died in 1881. In one point only, I could not entirely endorse Kessler's views. Kessler alluded to parental feeling and care for progeny, see below chapter 1, as to the source of mutual inclinations in animals. However, to determine how far these two feelings have really been at work in the evolution of sociable instincts, and how far other instincts have been at work in the same direction, seems to me a quite distinct and a very wide question which we can hardly can discuss yet. It will be only after we have well established the facts of mutual aid in different classes of animals and their importance for evolution that we shall be able to study what belongs in the evolution of sociable feelings to parental feelings and what to sociability proper. The later having evidently its origin at the earliest stages of the evolution of the animal world, perhaps even at the colony stages. I consequently directed my chief attention to establishing, first of all, the importance of mutual aid as a factor of evolution, leaving to ulterior research the task of discovering the origin of the mutual aid instinct in nature.